the lawn that we just unvigorated by fertilizing. So we, we've got a real pickle of a predicament here. And um, before I go into what a synthetic free lawn, synthetic free lawn, chemical free lawn is like, I'm gonna take a break and hand it over to Sarah and invite Sarah to tell us about the grassland ecology in Africa, because it's much sexier than our grassland ecology. Much as I like our earthworms, they've got springbuck over there. And uh, this is the iconic grazer of South Africa, so much so that uh, they named the national rugby team springbucks. And uh, so I'd like uh, Sarah to take it from there. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um... Good evening, everyone. Well, good evening for me and mm -hmm. good day to most of you. Um, yeah, I, I was just listening to that in a, on a micro scale that is planting a lawn is, is one reductionist decision that's knocked on two thousands of consequences that you then chase your tail trying to deal with. So this springbok in, in Southern Africa, we don't get springbok in in Zimbabwe, where I am, but we get something very similar, which is uh, um, we get impala. And they're a small antelope, uh, springbok and impala are very similar. And they're, they're just quite small antelope and they've got tiny, 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 very, very sharp hooves. And in about the late 1800s, um, well, the guys, this sort of, uh, I'll say it in Afrikaans, but in English, the the, guys that came looking for gold with their ox wagons and stuff. So, so they, they came from all over looking for gold and they had these big ox wagons of, of sort, sort of 16 oxen. And um, they, the, they described, some of those early guys that came described the herds of springbok as a sea of springbok. There were that many of these small antelope and if they didn't unhitch their wagons, their oxen, in time, the springbok would trample them. Now, an ox is huge and a springbok is a very little thing. So you can imagine then just the numbers of, of springbok. So, and it wasn't just springbok, it was springbok, it was buffalo, it was elephants, it was eland, it was all, all, our, all our herding animals. And that's, so, so our grasslands developed with huge millions and millions and millions and millions of, of herding animals. But today, the belief is that animals cause damage to grasslands and too many animals. So people say, oh, livestock cause damage or elephants cause damage, or you've got too many cattle on there, or you've got too many buffalo, or you've got too many, they keep saying there's too many and, and we cull animals, we, we get rid of them, we translocate them, we do all these things, but what I what what about all those millions of animals? What and we had really healthy grasslands back then. So so there's something very wrong in, in our thinking. So what and and this leads to my dad's work because when he was younger he saw this desertification happening all around where he grew up here in Zimbabwe and he thought but hang on these these guys in previous years we're talking about millions of animals and here we are saying we've got to cull animals because we've got too many or we're blaming livestock because they're they're overgrazing and anyway so I asked someone the other day when I was talking about this because they said to me no elephants cause damage or they and they said livestock cause damage so I said if someone Get if I said if I shot you right now with a gun, if I just shot you, would you blame me or the gun? Mm. And so that's what I said to him. I said it's not the animals that cause damage. Fossil fuels don't cause damage. Cattle don't cause damage. Elephants don't cause damage. We manage them. It's how we manage them that is causing the damage. So in my dad's work, he studied and studied and studied animals and he'd been taught at university, he'd been taught by his father, he'd been taught by all his training in, in wildlife management, these things. And eventually he put all the pieces of various people's work and his own observations together and he thought it's 
all about timing. And, and that's when it, when it became much more apparent. And it's what it is, is the precise timing of animals. So it's not number like huge numbers are, are wanted, but it's, it's the thing that keeps them moving so that they can't stay too long in one area. So he, my, so my dad would observe these huge herds of buffalo and they would come in, bunch together for safety from pack hunting predators. So that was what was keeping them moving correctly. And they would stay in an area only for two or three days and then they would, they would move on. And, he, and that, was the, that was the missing clue was the timing. So these huge herds will come through they would be grazing, trampling, stimulating plant growth, but at the same time, they'd be trampling old grass down. They'd be fertilizing it so they couldn't come back and eat it. And then they would leave and that grass got a chance to recover. And so that was what was being missed. So in the world's arid areas, so, so we call it brittle environments. So any areas of the world that experience long periods of dry season so so we like here we'll have nine months with no rain and then we'll have a short wet period but in the nine months of dry there's um, it's very low humidity so it's very brittle we call it brittle because in the dry periods if you pick up a leaf and you break it it crumples it's brittle but in areas that experience year-round humidity if you picked up a leaf at any time of year it would be soft so that's that's why we use the brittleness scale when we describe what kind of climate we're dealing with because somewhere like london has exactly the same um a very exactly the same so very similar rainfall per year as johannesburg but they have very different climates so we use the brittleness scale so all areas of the world that are very high on the brittleness scale developed with these big herds of animals mm -hmm. and and we now have wiped out, I mean, if you drive around now, you would never see millions of springbok, millions of impala, millions of elephants, millions of anything. You see little pockets of animals around. We've upset the balance between the predator and prey. So they mill around, they stay too long in one place. They're overgrazing. They're unable to do the job, not because they're causing, because of them, it's because we've upset this balance between predator, prey, and soil. And so what my dad discovered is that was because throughout history, we've only ever had three tools which we manage land with, and those are conservation or rest. So we, we rest the land, we burn it, or we use technology. So in these arid, brittle areas, if we, we can't solve a biological problem with technology. I think that's, that's the first thing. We can't solve desertification with technology. So we can't use technology to plant trees, etc. Nature knows what she's doing if we give her the right, the right input and the right, if we use the right tools. So then the reason we burn in these brittle areas was we wiped out so many of those herding animals that we now, after the rains, we have all this long grass and we have no animals to do their job of trampling it down and flattening it and fertilizing it. So we started to burn it, to clear it after the rains. And so we've replaced the role of ruminants with fire, but fire doesn't do the job. It just causes desertification. It leaves the, the soil bare and exposed and it doesn't fertilize it it's rapid chemical oxidation etc and that grass has to break down biologically and that's what the animals are there for so the other tool that we have had is rest and they still conservation is still here today or in brittle environments will advocate rest but rest kills grasslands in arid areas now if you rested an area that's in a non-brittle environment, in a humid environment, say a tropical forest or anywhere where there's consistent humidity, it would recover. You could, you could damage it as much as you want. And if you left it alone, it would recover because 
the microorganisms needed to break down all the material and be active can be active all year round and they they develop very differently with like little slugs and snails and smaller creatures and hedgehogs and and much more sort of forestry and foresty and sluggy things and they didn't have these huge herds of animals but in brittle environments it's absolutely vital that they get this trampling and if you look at especially springbok if you look at their hooves they've got the most tiny sharp 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 little hooves and we've raised lots of impala orphans and they they can really do damage their hooves are that sharp you know when you when you're looking after them and stuff so imagine those going over this capped hard soil they, they, they those tiny hooves will break up now they imagine there's a million of them a million hooves aerating that top level of the soil, breaking it up, what does that do? It starts to allow this flow of nutrients and air, carbon in the soil, oxygen, microorganisms can breathe, the nutrients can start to cycle, water can penetrate. So we talk about carbon, the grasslands, the world's grasslands are the biggest carbon sink and reservoir of fresh water the earth has. But we're only talking about it in trees and stuff like that. Trees are part of an ambient carbon cycling. They don't hold the carbon. The, the grasslands hold the carbon in the soil. So this is where a lot of people are missing the, the, how vital the, the, these brittle areas are and how vital animals are on these areas. And what we can do to help wildlife and the soil is we can mimic nature by using livestock to mimic the movement of those herds and start to get the, those cycles going again, the nutrient cycles and the, and the biodiversity returning. We don't have to, I can tell you right now that we don't have to plant anything. People run out and plant 20,000 trees in these arid areas. Why? We're not addressing why we're losing the trees. So we have these amazing teak forests, these big old hardwood trees. There's no seeds germinating. If nature's not growing them for herself, we can't plant them. Like, so, so that's the thing. And once we start the, the, the movement of the livestock and holistic plant grazing in those areas, it's amazing because the trees start to germinate. So um, yeah, it's, it's just incredible. I could go on for days. I love the, the thing. I just did a video this evening. I took my kids just down the road from where we live to a little game park. Uh, which is, you know, just with a bit of wildlife. So there was, there's zebras, giraffes, wildebeest. Now zebras and wildebeest should be in herds of, in their millions. So I, I just walked up to a little, I say a herd, there were about seven wildebeest and I was doing a, a, a video and they've used a tractor to clear all the long grass from the rains. So, <laughs> and it's just, it's just so bizarre that we're using these, these, this machinery and we're saying, no, the, we can't have too many animals on here, but we'll bring in machinery to, to do this job. And I was filming down, I was showing how, how much space is between each grass plant, how unhealthy la the land is. And then I say, look, we will bring a tractor in and we'll take up off all this amazing grass that should be mulched down and trampled and fertilized and just forming this protective mulch over the soil but we either burn it or we cut it or we, and then we ship it off to feed other animals. I mean, it's just, in, it's just like insanity. So yeah, um, the spring bark, the elephants, the, all, all these animals are perfectly designed to do a job to keep our soils healthy. And we upset the balance and mismanage them. And then we blame the, the resource, not, the, not our management of the resource. You know